Welcome to Beer 30, everybody. It's a, uh, it, it, I'm Pete Wright, and it's weird not uh, sitting next to you people. I feel like I, I should know. I should put some fake uh, some fake uh, beer uh, bar sounds in the uh, background. We should all drink beer, like, you know. But then you're drinking alone. That's not really as much fun. That's true. It's, it suddenly feels pretty desperate. Uh, on the, we're doing a, a a remote show today. We've got uh, uh, Jamie Whitley, who is sitting, uh, who's quarantined right now. Uh, more on yeah. that in yeah. a second. And Mary Bradbury Jones, who is, uh, I don't know, are you are you driving around with your cell phone, uh, not hands free? With right my now? handheld. Yeah, with your handheld. With my handheld. Uh, no, no, I'm not. Well, we are sitting here. We're doing a remote show because uh, it, Jamie uh, had the flu scare. Right? That would be a good way to put it, the flu scare. The yep. flu scare, yep. yeah. It's because you were punked by karma <laughs> is what that is. I know. I know. Well, I got to tell you guys, I don't know if you know anybody that has the swine flu yet, and, and we obviously thought we might have had it, so we kind of went into lockdown mode, but you don't want to get it. So, dude, get your shot as soon as it comes <laughs> You know, why do you say you don't want to get it? No, you do not. I, I know. I, why? Well, I know a, a few people that have gotten it, and they say it's just miserable. And, and the oh. aches and the pains, and, and it takes quite a while to get over it, and it's just, it's just miserable. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's not something that I would wish on anybody, from what I am told from people who have gotten it. We, of course, thought we had it uh, with my oldest daughter. Uh, but there is no real test. There is a test, but it takes a couple of days to get the results back. And by the time you get the results back, you will know if you got it or not. So we elected not to get the test and just kind of go into lockdown mode and see what happened. And fortunately, her fever went down and, and we're in good shape. But uh, it doesn't mean we might not get it tomorrow because word on the street from the doctor's office is it's, it's everywhere. And it's just it's pretty prevalent at this point. We had uh, we've had a couple of kids from my uh, my daughter's school uh, sent home with it confirmed, and uh, and it, you know I think originally they were they were not even uh, the doctors that you that you know our, the school was calling they they are to the point where they're not even you know seeing kids anymore. You describe the symptoms and they're telling you over the phone you that okay you've you've got it right uh, watch it carefully. Um, and what they were saying, the, the, the reason they were really terrified in the, you know, uh, this early in the flu season is that they hadn't seen the regular flu hit yet. And so, you know, every case is the, is the H1N1 strain. But now it sounds like uh, both flus are, um, you know, full on in season. Uh, the government has their new flu.gov website, which talks about the spread and what you can do and where you can get shots and, and um uh, you know, everything we've heard is it's just like the regular flu, uh, but it hurts a lot more. It sucks more. You have a much higher fever, and instead of being over it in, you know, two to three days, it takes 10 to 14 days to shake it. Yeah. Uh, and so wow. you really are suffering for a long, long time. That, um, uh, you know, the, the thing that was... Um, you know, so you add to that the fact that you can't, you know, you're quarantined until 24 hours after the the fever has gone down. It's just this sort of unknown for for such a long time that you really are, you know, I've got my kids scrubbing their hands to the bone. You know, I, I, we come home at the end of the day and we, we tape the duct tape, the visqueen over all the windows and. We don't talk, answer the door anymore, and and uh, you're not going to a swine flu party like some people are doing. Oh my god, what a swine flu party! Yeah, you ever heard about that? No. Oh yeah, well, like some idiot parents, you know how like if your kid gets the measles or the mumps and stuff, they used to here go visit some other kid that has the, right. the chicken pox. I guess is probably the right one, and, and so that way you can get it and you can get you know immune to it later on. Uh so some parents have been purposely mixing their kids with other kids who had swine flu, uh, which I think is just flipping ridiculous. <laughs> this is fantastic. Like a bunch of morons. I just, I just found the article. This is Dr. Walter White of the University of Alabama at Birmingham saying bluntly, uh, a swine flu party, it is a very, very bad idea. 
<laughs> it goes against everything medicine and public health are trying to do to encourage social distancing for the infected, and it could hamper efforts to control the disease completely. <laughs> Oh my God! You know this on top. This whole parents, they're idiots. All right. What is this? Have you heard about this thing now with the uh, with the parent in in uh, a fight with the football coach, punching the football coach? No, no. Oh good lord! See now I brought it up. I don't have the article in front of me, but uh, it's it's just, it's just this whole idea that parents are a, a little bit overzealous in their uh, in their uh, know it alliness. And uh, mm-hmm. it's it's starting to it's starting to get a little frustrating. I mean, I know so I what, have vibes of disagreed with parental with rage. How the coach was coaching. Yeah, exactly. Um, Setting a good example for their kid, you know, on how to act. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what a moron. <laughs> hey, speaking of examples, how about Maria Shriver setting an example on how to drive and talk on a cell phone, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. so so uh, I hear uh, uh, Arnold Arnold is not very happy with you, Maria. <laughs> No, he's I'm not. Going to throw you in he the slammer. <laughs> he told the reporter, thanks for bringing her violation to my attention. There's going to be swift action. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put Maria in my Iron Maiden in the basement for four days uh, with only white bread and we, no cell phones. Do we have a rule like that yeah. here, Morgan? Uh, I am not sure. Uh, I'm checking that right now. But the the biggest one is Utah's uh, text messaging law. Uh, oh, have you heard about this? Utah is the is the toughest of the the text messaging laws, um, and it says that uh, you know you you can't if if you are using your wireless communication device for text messaging or email while operating a motor vehicle, you can be put in jail for up to 15 years. Wow. What? Yeah, House Bill 290. Um, Holy moly! That's passed or it hasn't passed yet? No, it's uh, it was. Let's see, uh, July first, two thousand nine. Did it pass? Um, wow, that's a bit much. So it's okay to have two wives, but you can text and drive. <laughs> I'm just saying. Right or marry marry eleven year olds. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, no, they, they have the uh, – it is legal to use a cell phone in Utah while you're driving if you're going hands-free. So they're one of the states that's hands-free only. But apparently a kid uh, – uh, somebody killed a kid while text messaging, and um, uh, and so this was the response. And I'll tell you, I'm I'm totally on the fence. I posted this. Uh, I posted a link on my uh, my Facebook page about this, and and uh, I got some really interesting comments. I had a couple of of moms uh, write back saying, "Oh, wow, well, you know, 15 years for uh, for killing somebody. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, I think that's fair. Yeah. But I. I well, I thought. Oh, it's. I thought you said it's just 15 years for doing it. Well, that's the that's the issue, right? That's the that's the leap that people are making. The bill is 50, up to 15 years for doing it. Now, of course, there's so much gray area. If you're just doing it and you're caught speeding, you're probably going to get a slap on the wrist or whatever. But um, oh, well. you know, I, I don't I don't know. It's just a very serious thing. But what people are saying is that you know this law is totally appropriate for the crime, and I don't think it is. I mean, at, at what point? You know, I think if you kill somebody, you go away for killing somebody, not for text messaging. Right. Exactly. You go uh, away yeah. for vehicular manslaughter. Right. There's already a law for that. It's like the Apple commercial, right? There's an right. app for that. There's a law for that already. Uh, yeah. You know, it's called "Don't be an idiot," and uh, and and you're going to go to jail if you are an idiot doing something stupid. I mean, when is it going to be? Somebody posted a comment on my on my Facebook page about uh, saying that uh, you know when's it going to be illegal to have a mustache while driving? Uh, <laughs> right. Well, yeah, but come on. I mean, let poll here. Have you ever texted and, dr- and drove or drive? Uh, Have you? N- not while moving. Not while moving? No. Mary? Not while moving, but at stoplights, yeah. Yeah. I have, and it's really distractive. I, I mean, it just it's not something I'd recommend that anybody can you know do. So I can see discouraging people from texting and driving because I see people do right. it all the time. You're driving down the freeway and you look over and there's and it's usually uh, a, you know somebody who's younger, a kid or something. Yeah, oh, that's not always true. 
texting and driving. And quite frankly, it's very distractive, and it takes your eyes off the road. So, well, you know, I, so well, why can't they just why can't they just lose their license? Yeah, I, I agree with that. It should be something. Fifteen years seems a little ridiculous because, like you said, quite frankly, if you do run over somebody, there's a certain issue of manslaughter or some other crime that fits. Yeah. Just, right. Being, this know. is this this sort of uh, trend to over legislate because of emotion and you know is exactly is, uh, oh. is oh coming from a liberal like you that's great what are you serious <laughs> I'm telling liberals you liberals are not for legislating everything <laughs> oh, oh come on give me a break every break you know <laughs> oh man don't even get me started. I, really? I, that's not. I just don't think that's. A, I don't think that's a fair assessment of my 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 historical stance on this show. You do tend to be pretty middle of the road. I'm Doc. pretty middle of the road. I I'm I'm not for. I'm you know for example I got okay here's I got a hundred dollar ticket for uh, not wearing my seatbelt. Yeah. Where do, you, for- where do you stand on the click it or ticket thing in light of the te- no texting and driving thing? I. I think you should be required to, to wear your seatbelt, and maybe that's not a very good thing coming from somebody who's pretty conservative, you know, the free and who drives a motorcycle. Who <laughs> drives a motorcycle? Uh, but the reason I say that I, I think you should be required to put on your seatbelt is because uh, the cost to society is pretty high uh, mm-hmm. in terms of trying to take care of people who don't wear their seatbelt. Yeah, I can. I agree After with that. After accident. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you yeah. know. Yeah. Right. For, right. For, that, that's one of those things. It's sort of like I, uh, I I find that interesting that you think that that's that's <laughs> fine. Yeah, no, I can I can see that. Yep. Uh, I I was actually okay with getting this ticket, and it's and and the the reason was that you know I I now put on my seatbelt every single time I get in the car because Good. I don't want to be that guy. But you know how much the fine actually was? It was twenty three dollars. The, you look at the Don't breakdown of the receipt, and it's like the line item after line item of taxes and fees to get people up in the morning uh, uh, to process this ticket, which is oh, – and that, that made me frustrated. I was like, come on. Is, is, so really the, the penalty is worth $23 to you? It's if, just, if, if you like that, then, Pete, then you're going to love the health care plan that was passed by the Finance Committee. I'm, I'm pretty – taxes the hell out of everything. I know. I'm pretty excited about that. Are you now? Are uh, you excited about being taxed more? Get uh, this. Taxed more just so you can give insurance money to people who can't afford it so the insurance companies can make more money. I mean, how beautiful is that? Yeah, no, this exactly. uh, this played out exactly as it should if you're a, a an insurance company executive. I mean, we've really taken care of the people in need, the the, you know, billionaire CEOs of insurance companies. And okay. and I think it's important that we not forget that that they've been through a lot of trauma and emotional pain through this whole ordeal. <laughs> Absolutely. I I don't know about you guys, but the bill as it comes out, my understanding is again, tax you some more on on either whether you get really good benefits or if you buy things like maybe you need a wheelchair, let's tax that, uh, and then give that money to people who can't afford insurance so then the insurance companies just get a bigger pool to pull from. There's nothing in there about lowering the cost. There's nothing in there about creating competition, uh, improving right. benefits overall. It's all about more tax money to cover more people so we can all just suffer a little more. What a bunch of bullshit. Right, and they've already – haven't they already come out and said that there's, that premiums are going to go up regardless? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what the insurance yeah. lobbies have said. The day yes. before this was due to come out, out for a vote, they yep. come out with this report saying we guarantee you that this bill will increase rates for everyone. <laughs> Are right. you joking? Oh, I'm pissed. Well, I just it's I a know. Fun. And you know what what I heard is when you watch, you know, when you watch the finance committee, there's always this um oh, this brunette that sits behind, you know, Bacchus. I mean, they have all their staffers and stuff, you know, sitting behind them and coming up and whispering stuff in their ears or whatever. But this one she has a bob and, and brunette. It's escaping my name. But anyway, she um of course now works for Bacchus, but she is a uh uh, she did come from WellPoint. Oh, of course. So she was big, kind of WellPoint, oh, you know, lobbyist. This is this is a health insurance lobbyist bill. I mean, it's been uh-huh. made exactly for them. We haven't done anything to help the average middle class America. Nothing. It's a I know. liberal it's bill. Disgusting. 
It's, it's just, one of those things, you know, I mean, I've, I talked, I think, last week about how I'm, I, I don't really believe that the, the, our representatives in Congress are up to the intellectual and political challenge of governance anymore. And I, I, I really, this, I think, is a major indicator. I get, I'm, I'm really getting tired of people who are so fired up about teabagging and taxes and are not fired up about the people who've created this gigantic cluster. I agree. I agree. You know, th- I'm, I I cannot. It stuns me that we're we're trying to solve the wrong problem. The right problem mm-hmm. to solve is uh, we need to vote out the entire congressional body. They need to be replaced. That's the message. Term limits. Right. Term, Term. limits. Absolutely. Yeah. Right, yes, but even if you vote them all out, you know, I'll go back to my, you know, what I've been broken record about is the system forces in many ways them to have to behave this way so you get a whole new lot of people Mm -hmm. it's still the same system where they have to have all this money to run so we're still really in the same place that we were but don't you think term limits don't you think term limits would fix that i mean if people didn't believe that they had that they could make a career out of being a a congressman or a senator uh, you know, if they it, don't, you think we'd get some people in the body of uh, the body politic that um, you know that maybe weren't afraid of making some hard decisions? Yeah, that's the theory. I mean, I well, what are you what are you saying? Term limit of one time? No, I mean, I th- say make it the same oh. as a presidential term. Uh, well, but so that you know, don't we don't really when that we have the with the president? I mean, we really get three year you know three years of well, not even that because it probably takes them really truly a good. Six months to get completely ramped up. Yeah, and, and another, then, and then you, you start when you hit campaigning. Uh, you know, eighteen months before the end of your term. Exactly. So well, you get that's about all two they years. do for the next eighteen months. Right. Well, Obama's already campaigning for midterm elections. Sure. I mean, I, I've, I've heard him out on the stump. You know, on the on oh, the yeah. trail, uh, stumping for candidates already. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's it, half your time is spent, as we all know, campaigning and half the time legislating. And, and they don't do the right. legislative part very well anymore, in my opinion. So I'm pissed exactly. about that. And then we all stand around not understanding why nothing ever gets done. Yeah. <laughs> right. Or you get watered down solutions that are run by special interest, which is what the health care yes. reform has really become. It's a, from my perspective, it's a pile of crap. I hope what they've passed today out of, you know, our, out of finance the other day, I hope that that does not become law. And I, I hope it doesn't make it to the floor and I hope it doesn't pass. It's crap. There's nothing but yeah. raise my rates. Doesn't help I agree. at all. Misses I agree. the point. bunch of crap. It is. It's it just is. terrible. It's frustrating. It's very frustrating. I'm moving to Canada. That's not true. Here we tell me, yeah, tell me there's a segue in that. <laughs> I, I don't have Canada on the rundown here. Uh no, no, no. Oh, I'm not. I just it's just frustrating to me, that's all. So uh, but, yeah. Good it's news. gonna be interesting. Because what comes next, though? Right now, they go to the now they go to the floors and they have to try to come up. They need to take all the bills and come up with one, right? Yeah, and what I hear is that you know public option is still on the table, and that uh, again, my guy Wyden still um, thinks that he's going to be able to get through his piece, which is competition, which is what's missing from this bill, in, in my opinion. There's no incentive to do change anything because there's no competition. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my hope is. You know, public finance in some way, and and they're talking about it. Maybe it's a trigger. I mean, that would be better than nothing. Uh, and I hope that yeah, goes but... through. And I hope I hope Wyden's piece goes through, so we can have true competition. But without those, I don't I don't know how you really have health care reform. Trigger, I think a was... trigger is a joke, though. Yeah. I mean, trigger when what? Yeah, I don't know. It probably. I mean, it depends on how you do it. I I, I just. It's the most well, powerful. 65% finally doesn't have health insurance, so we trigger. Yeah, I don't know, Mary. I, I just think it might be the most palatable way to get it um, because everybody says, no, it'll lower costs. You know, the current program, yet it'll lower costs. Yes, it'll cover more people, blah, blah, blah. But if it doesn't hit its goals, then maybe maybe putting in a public option is is the right way to go, and so you you build a trigger in that says if you don't hit the requirements, we're gonna go we're gonna do a public option. That might stand a chance of passing. Where a straight public option probably wouldn't stand a chance of passing by itself. Yeah, I don't know. I just think they'll they'll have it so finagled and and 
and mismanaged that it won't the trigger would never happen anyways. Yeah, I don't trust them. That would be my fear. I wouldn't trust them either. That is my fear that they'll write some kind of loophole in there that'll never really yep. happen, and so they can say it's there to give themselves public cover, but in reality, it's it's not really a, a real thing. Yeah. I agree. Oh, it's just, it's and I think it's inferior. also Olympia Snow's way to sit and ride the fence. It, it probably is. I was a little surprised she voted for it, but well, yeah. she's had the spotlight on her for a good two months now, and and uh, right. that, that can't hurt for the next election. Yeah, exactly. Of course, as she said, that doesn't mean this is how I'll vote on the floor. <laughs> yeah, oh, of course. No, she's yeah. definitely got one foot in each pot. Yeah, yeah it's unfortunate. <sighs> oh, it's so frustrating. Uh, and how many people live in Maine? Okay, I won't even go there. Yeah, I know. We've been there before. <laughs> but in light of all of this, right? I mean, in light of all of this, uh, um, you know, healthcare nonsense, still, Barack Obama wakes up one morning to the news that he has won, not only been nominated, but won the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> Crazy. Didn't even know he had been nominated. Uh, yeah. uh you know, I posted something on my Facebook page or, or on our Facebook page for Beard 30 about how Obama, though, it was snubbed really for for Nobel Prizes in science and other areas. So I don't know what's going on with those guys. What, what do you mean? He, was, like, what? He, he didn't add another element to the periodic table? Uh, yeah. I mean, come on. I Obama mean, site. I mean, really, think about the Peace Prize. I mean, what has really Obama done in terms of? And I'm sure he's made a difference, but come on at this point. So he's probably contributed just as much to peace as he has to science or solving world hunger or any of the other you know, noble things that the Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize is known for. So I'm a little disappointed. He just hasn't taken everything. Well, you're right. A sweep would have been nice. Yes, exactly. But exactly. I, I also, I, you know, I think that um, I think some of that is is – uh, it's, it's been worthy. I mean, I think one of the things that, that still in light of every, all the frustrations that we have over how he is, you know, how we've talked about how he's not, you know, he's not enough of a leader. He's not enough of, you know, whatever, what, what I really, uh, find, uh, worthy of this is just the, or that he is worthy of the award is that he has been, uh, so active in changing the, the global conversation toward the United States. And uh, I think that is a, uh, I think that is an extremely positive, uh, a positive thing. Um, well, to, it's really, don't you think, just a diss at George Bush? Yeah, I mean, this is this is definitely a, a way to show uh, the changing tide of support for the United mm-hmm. States as a result of, or in contrast to, uh, that of George Bush. So that's definitely true. It certainly seems that way. I think studies I've seen show that people are viewing the U.S. in, in a more favorable light. So I think that's that's good. I just think it's a little it's a little premature. And and I I, I was surprised he didn't uh, that he didn't just turn it down uh, and and move on and you know pick it up another time, which you probably will. It you just, know, I don't I don't know. When was the last time you heard of somebody being offered the Nobel Peace Prize and saying, eh, you know, no thanks? But wouldn't it have said something to have turned it down and say, you know, this is really gracious, but uh, there are other people who have contributed to peace, you know, far more than, than I have uh, that are probably. Well, didn't more- he say that in his speech? He said that in his speech. He did. He did. It just I, w- I was just a little surprised he didn't turn it down. But- I, I think I don't think that's the play. I mean, I, I really think what he did was, you know, take here. That's great. I I didn't know it was coming. I don't necessarily agree, but. I appreciate the recognition and I'm going to keep working toward, um, you know, toward this global dialogue of cooperation in, instead of consolidation and, and competition. And uh, I'm going to take the $1.4 million that comes with the prize and then I'm going to give it to, to uh, you know, associated charities and whatever. Uh, you know, it, it, it sort of puts it away where it belongs. Now his name's on a big list and that's fine. And the Nobel Committee's happy. They have snubbed George Bush and the rest of the globe is happy. We can move on. I mean, it, it's sort of not a. I, I think had he said no, it would have become a massive story. Yeah, it, maybe so. I mean, I can buy that. Yeah. I, I, it, instead, it, he's it, trying to use it as a call to action to all countries to come to the table. Right. You uh, know, when it comes to nuclear proliferation or whatever the case may be. 
because now he's got <laughs> look what I got. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, it was probably damned if you do or damned if you don't type of thing. Uh, you know, I, I was just a little surprised it came out in the first place, but oh yeah, as as I think was he. Yeah. yeah but... uh, do you hear what? Uh, do you hear the uh, the Rush Limbaugh interview? I heard no, but it's 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 he, uh, he's going for the football team, right? Yeah, maybe that's why he was interviewed. Uh, he, you know, he rarely does these uh, direct media interviews, but you know, he's got a lot of heat on him right now. He's going for buying the St. Louis Rams, and uh, so he sat down. Well, not and so, but he, in uh, addition to, he sat down with uh, with an NBC reporter and and uh, totally railroaded her in her anemic interview. Uh, Which is horrible. Oh, Which is terrible. Was What's that, Jamie? Was it CBS or no, I think it was NBC. NBC. And uh, and so she sat down with him and asked him things like, uh, you know, do you think you're ruining the Republican Party? Um, do you think you're leading the Republican Party? Um, you know, why are you so mean? <laughs> I mean, it's just really, uh, really awful. And he was to his show. Wherever she got her journalism degree, they should be embarrassed. No, it was it was yeah, it was not a good uh, not a good example. Uh, you know, he did things like you, you know just yawning uh to her questions <laughs> just openly right well that was yawning yeah, yeah. Uh, about the uh how tired he is of of these you know tiresome comments and questions uh there was nothing really substantive except for when asked uh to think of one thing that he really liked about barack obama what did he say his response was he's got a great voice <laughs> that man can read from a teleprompter like nobody I've ever seen. It's magical. That's funny. Oh, it's fantastic. But, you know, he is not – some of this in the, the NFL thing has been a little overblown. He's not leading the group to buy the, the Rams. He's just one of a consortium of people that is wanting to buy it. So he's an investor, and what I understand, not even a major investor in this group. So it's a little ridiculous that they're focusing on him. It's just like I bought shares in Intel, you know, so does that mean that all of a sudden if I get arrested, that's like a huge problem in Intel? I mean, it's right. a little overblown in my opinion. Yeah. Well, I think in general Limbaugh is overblown. Uh, you know, right now it's he's sort of the voice box of, of the angry Republican right. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, you can't there's – a, there's a great article, uh, a great post from Robert – uh, this Schlesinger at U- on U.S. News and World Report today. It's it's don't blame liberals when Limbaugh can't buy the Rams. Blame the free market. Like you're not focusing on the right target. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And and quite I I think and I, I've listened to Rush off and on and, uh, as I try to listen to a lot of folks as I have time. Uh, he's not as bad as people make him out to be, and he's not the god that other people make him out to be. You know, he's just the guy with an opinion who happens to be pretty conservative and. And he articulates his opinion very well, and it's very uh, convincing to certain groups. But he's not—he's not the devil uh, that would make him out to be. You know, he's an entertainer. Well, that's the—that's the truth. And I, I think if more people would listen exactly. to him as an entertainer, yeah, uh, instead you know, of be in making place. him out to be something more than he is, he's not a politician. He's got opinions. Sometimes he's right, sometimes he's wrong. I mean, you know, it's just the way that it is. But but to try and demagogue him and say that all of a sudden he can't own the piece of the Rams, listen, congratulations, dude. Millions of people listen to you. You've made millions of dollars. If you want to spend your money buying a piece of the Rams, go ahead. That's my opinion, you know. Look, they let Leonza yeah. Hemley or whatever her name was, you know, own pieces of sports teams, and she was as bigoted and racist as they come. So She had some other issues, too, even more than bigotry and racism. But my point is, is if, I mean, if you're going to let that happen, why, I mean, you know, what's wrong with Rush? So, good point. Of course, he uh, didn't he in the interview, Pete, say say that he's responsible for Glenn Beck, or uh, yeah, that that he's Glenn, yeah, Glenn Beck wouldn't be who he is if it wasn't for if Rush it wasn't for Rush. Like but I, you know, and I think he was yeah. speaking more as a as a leader of a of a broader trend of uh, demand for the Limbaugh style of. Yeah, or talk, or the you know, I mean, radio and TV has become a lot more divisive, and so he certainly has kind of driven this this in- confrontational, in your face, take no prisoners type of approach, and he's probably been modeled by a lot of people on the left and the right. Good for him. I mean, 
Well, I mean, you know, it, it, you take that as a, a sort of a jumping off point for the White House's position on Fox News. Uh, mm-hmm. Have you heard about this uh, this latest salvo? I thought this was surprising. Uh-uh. Uh, White House Communications Director Anita Dunn comes out and says that Fox News is no longer an, a, a news organization. It is a wing, as a quote, a wing of the Republican Party. The reality of it is that Fox News often operates almost as either the research arm or the communications arm of the Republican Party. Uh, Interesting. It's, it is, uh, quote, uh, an opinion journalize, uh, journalism masquerading as news. News. I totally agree with that. Now, Jamie, you uh, you leave it on all the time at your house, right, to indoctrinate <laughs> the kids. What's your stance on that? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think we have reached a point where journalism is under uh, attack as not being very it's, – it's always been supposedly this sacred thing that's, that's fair, that's objective, that presents both sides, that, that gets to the truth. And, and I don't think journalism is, is like that anymore uh, and, uh, on both sides. And so it tends to be more of a kind of a hatchet opinion pieces. And Fox News is certainly full of a lot of people with a lot of opinions, probably more so than some of the other networks. Uh, and those yeah, opinions, except, you know, they do. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, those opinions tend to be on the right side, on the not, they tend not to be left, they tend to be on the right hand side of the argument. So. It's a uh, it's a funny thing. And here's thing. an interesting. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead, Mary. This is so weird not being able to see who's talking. Um, uh, well, the other thing that I always found that's interesting, and they've done it like multiple times, but the latest time I can remember that they did it was with Mark San- uh, Stanford when his whole uh, stuff was blowing up, and they had on the screen Mark Stanford, Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> And they've done that with multiple Republicans when they've, you know, had these scandals, and then they come on the thing and put a D after their name. Yeah, yeah I don't know. It's well, hard. you know, the problem is this: uh, that it, of course they're fair and balanced. You know. Well, yeah, fair and balanced, right? That that ensures that they're not. <laughs> they, the the. Uh, it, it, the problem is this, that, that modern media has been taken over by and, and run by people who are not, in fact, journalists. Exactly. You know, a journalist is somebody who exactly. went to school and studied the, the craft of journalism. And that's a very different role than the role that, that uh, you know, many of the cable news networks uh, uh, sort of fall into today with this idea of, of you know, the good-looking, the entertainers, the... Um, you know, people on the air. Now, Fox in, has gone much further than that. Yep. Um, you know, I, I, I really tend to agree with Anita Dunn here that, I, you know, Fox is, Fox is a troubled uh, sort of cancer on the media establishment. Not that they're all, you know, great, but Fox is really, really an exemplar of, of um, you know, poor media. Uh, but I love this quote. You know, if you were a Fox viewer in the fall election, what you would have seen would have been that the biggest stories and the biggest threats facing America were a guy named Bill Ayers and something called Acorn. Right? The yeah. economy is grappling with financial crisis, two wars, and a historic election. And if you were on Fox News, you wouldn't have heard about much of that. So, it's, I mean, Fox is is uh, is a troubled um, is is a trub- in a troubling place, in my opinion. I think. Uh, I, I think it's dangerous. I think it's a dangerous thing to to watch more than the other. I agree. As I was told by one conservative, it's the only place where you can get the truth. <laughs> Says Fox. So. Yeah. You know, it would be interesting to have a study, and I'm sure they have these. We'll have to spend some time. I, a study on who watches certain channels. And I'll give, give an example. I was thinking about this the other day. I was looking at an article online about who buys certain cars. And and people who buy Hondas, for example, tend to be uh, a little more educated. Their Internet use they, tends to be way up, so a lot of them use the Internet. People who buy Chevys, for example, tend to use the Internet a lot less, tend to be less educated, and et cetera. So it would be interesting to tie that same type of study to different news channels of what is their education level, income level, uh, you know, and that kind of stuff, to kind of see where they're pulling their users from. I'm sure they've got that data. Mm-hmm. I just haven't seen it. You know, you should check oh, I'm out, sure it's out there. Check out the movie. It's a documentary called Outfoxed. 
uh, which is oh, I've heard about that. it's a fantastic uh, view on just how bad Fox is uh, and and just how much of an active editorial role Rupert Murdoch takes. I mean, this is the News Corp is in general. Uh, you know, he considers it and is on the record in this movie as saying that this is his editorial arm and he's, uh, you know, he makes uh, makes editorial decisions not based on, you know, news, so to speak, but based on, uh, you know, who he wants to angle uh, for the election. Uh, you know, Fox mm-hmm. takes the, the talking points and pretty much dumps them on the air. And well, the- Murdoch sits at the table there. If you control the media, you control the message. Right. right? That's, that's the... Yep argument there. And, and Obama, of course, has been penalized for being everywhere, doing everything. But I think part of it is he's trying to control the message uh, so that he gets heard through everything else. Well, and that's the that's, I right. think, maybe the most interesting point in this whole thing is the fact that the White House took a stand against Fox. Uh, yeah, it's a little, although didn't Bush do the same thing against somebody else? I don't remember who it was, but I don't think this I don't is. I don't think a, Bush ever went on anything anyway. Well, not. Yeah. you know, and she she was asked, "Is is Obama ever going to go on uh, on Fox? Is he ever going to appear on a Fox show?" And she said, "Yes." But you have to understand that our opinion is when he goes on a Fox uh, to be interviewed by somebody at Fox, it's not going to be uh, to be interviewed. It's going to be in a position to debate the alternative view. Uh, mm-hmm. And yeah. he was on Bill O'Reilly. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. At some point, I can't remember when, but Bill O'Reilly interviewed him. So, hey, hey, speaking of celebrities, this is a little off topic in politics. What do you guys think about uh, our friend over there uh, on the Late Show, or the, was it the Late Show? It's nice. Oh, Letterman. Yeah. Uh, oh, Letterman. Wow. Yeah. I'm so interested in. That. I can't believe we haven't uh, been together in so long. What? Uh, man. Well, what do you think? Right. So, I mean, he's been hanging around with some of his, uh, you know, colleagues and. Uh, He's got himself a little bedroom upstairs, I guess. What do you think? I want Mary to go first. He has a bedroom upstairs? He has a hidden bed couch or like a sleeper in his office. Oh, that's what uh, it is. That's the idea. And they're, 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 I've heard mixed reports that it is a hidden sex den in his office. To It's just a fold-out couch that sometimes well, he has used to sleep with staff. Fox, right? Fox News was probably saying That's that. right. It was the sex yeah. den. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, I, I mean, is anybody really that surprised? I'm not. I mean, no, 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 no. I what? I don't. I don't think there's a surprise in it. <laughs> David Letterman. You know. I mean, okay, I'll go. One, I'm not. Gee, you know. <laughs> I mean, I'm not surprised in the slightest. Happens all the time in business. Uh, two, uh, I think he handled it pretty doggone well. He just came out and said, "I did it," and. Yeah. You know, and, and these are the mistakes I made and I'm sorry for my staff and, and et cetera. And he just faced it front on. I mean, he did it way better than Edwards has done with, you know, way better. Oh, yeah. way better. So, I, I think he did fine. It, it, sure. Was it the cool thing to do? No. But, you know, he handled it pretty well and he's moving forward. I I think he's done a decent job at it and, and good for him. The, yeah, uh, what's happening with the guy that tried to uh, – Blackmail him. Oh, he's he's been arrested and he's taken up. away. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, it's a uh, it's an interesting thing. So, um, yeah, he was he, he was a, an Emmy award winning um, uh, producer for uh, Forty Eight Hours, uh, and and you know he's a, a high profile uh, newsman at CBS, and so it was a bit of a surprise that that he would do that. Although Olbermann was interesting because Olbermann has worked with both of these guys. And um, and said, you know, I mean, you ask me on a list of uh, 50 guys, not knowing any of this, if you say, here are these 50 guys that you know and have worked with, who do you think would be most likely to be caught up in a scandal where he was blackmailing somebody famous? And he said, this guy, frankly, would be in the top five. Like, he's kind of creepy. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, that was fascinating. He uh, – the – I, I think more interesting is the National uh, Organization for Women, right? Uh, they were uh, furious uh, at Letterman. They think CBS needs to take action. I don't know what that means, take action. But, for what? Uh, yeah. Right. I, you know, I had think, an affair? Well, yeah. I mean, that's sort of the, the, the stake, right? It's this, um, uh, it's this idea that he did something that was, what, illegal? N- no. 
No. And we don't know if he had an affair because he's only been married for eight months. We don't know when these happened. Uh, We know he had a series of sexual relationships with women on his staff. Maybe that's not nice. Uh, Maybe it's not... Uh, uh, it's not uh, going uh, in accordance with the HR rules of CBS, but really, right. it may not be the most ethical. But uh, re- really, is it is is it re- really something we're going to lose a lot of sleep over and get fired up over? It's Dave Letterman. I mean, come on. Oh, but, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I agree with you, Pete. I, I, I do too. And like I said, I think the way he handled it is really good. I know. If there's anything that we learned out of this is, man, just reaffirmed how well that guy can handle a crowd. Well, yeah, and and the way that he did it, you know, confronting it, um, and and in his case, of course, he made jokes about it because that's just the way he is. That's his show, and and then just saying, listen, I, I did it. I'm sorry, I made mistakes, and then moving on. I think it really sets an example for people of how you should handle this kind of stuff. And, and this whole idea exactly. of just ignoring it or hiding it or whatever, not fessing Lying. up, go away. Yeah, it just, it just hurts you. I mean, again, Edwards is a classic example of that versus how Letterman did it. So good for Letterman. Yeah. Congratulations, dude. Yeah, uh, I completely agree. Okay, so uh, speaking of celebrities... Uh, this is not actually speaking of them. Uh, what's up? What you, Mary, you brought up the, uh, the kidnap victim week. We've got, uh, the first, was it yes. the first pictures of JC Dugard are coming out now? Who's yes, this? The first, oh. Yeah. Well, JC well, was Jay- the, the person, the, the girl who was kidnapped when she was younger and then forced to live as a, I don't know. What do you call her? Oh, in that guy's backyard For or something. 18 years. Yeah. 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 I mean, can you just imagine being, I mean, that long as parents, I mean, you, you know, you would have come to, you know, the conclusion that that, you know, your child had to be gone, you know, had to well, be dead. Well, here's the, I mean, here's, just what, I mean. There's a piece that makes me particularly mm-hmm. sick over it because, you know, this is a, this is a fear. I think every parent has at some level. It's the, the fact that in this case, her father saw it happen. He saw her. Oh, take that's it. right. Yeah. They. And yeah. chase the, the chase the truck. Or yeah, exactly. Uh huh. Oh, wow. That's right. Can you? I mean, can do I mean, you even, just, Where do you oh. even start to deal with that kind of rage oh, and yeah. guilt? I, oh, I wouldn't God. even know where to begin. Uh, I don't did know. her parents stay married? They didn't, did they? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. Yeah, I've read that a lot of times. That's, that's the type of thing that would rip a marriage apart too. That's what know? I've heard. So, yep. what was the news this week, though? Did she? Uh, what happened? Well, it's just that she's she's finally, you know, making telling a little bit of her story, and I guess she's on the cover of People. So, and it's the first time people have actually really seen her since she's been sheltered and and hidden since they found her. Yeah. So that's a big thing. And then I guess because on a lot of the magazine covers now too is Elizabeth Smart. And I guess it must be it's, she's maybe just testified or is going to testify against her captors. I'm doing a quick Google here to see if we can get find her story quickly. But now, uh, um, she she was the one that was kidnapped. She was what? Gosh, maybe seven or something oh, wow. at the time. And and they came into the ha- he came into the house in the middle of the night oh, and, and took, took her? her out of her bed. Uh huh. Wow. And um, let's see. She, the kidnapping occurred in 2002 uh, in June, and she's from Salt Lake, Utah. Um, and then she was found. She was found nine months later on March 12, 2003. Wow. Um, wan- wandering um, in a parking lot, I think, or something. I mean, her captors were nearby. Oh, oh my goodness. Anyway, so she's back. She's back in the news. And I mean, like I said, I just, I just was glancing at covers when I was in the grocery line. And I think it, I think maybe that there's something she's testifying now finally, or, or the, I don't know. Uh, anyway, the other one that's come out and, and I don't know all the details, uh, but I, I saw it briefly this morning is one of the mothers from the Columbine kids who, uh, Oh yes. Has come out with an essay talking about, uh, you know, her feelings. And, and, and I think what I've read online is uh, it's, it's, 
helped create some closure for some of the other parents of because they've never the parents have never publicly talked about their kids and what happened and uh, and so for her to sit down and kind of bear her soul about what happened and how she feels and did she know and did she have any inklings of her kids and all that I think has been uh, healing for a lot of folks and very what little I read excerpts were very interesting. Wow. Yeah, she said she had no inkling her son was suicidal or depressed. Yeah, she said that it's when a, when she heard the school was locked down and people were killed, she was worried that it was her her son that had gotten killed. She had no idea that right. he was the one who was, who was committing the, the crimes. Yeah, and then she later said that she thought that he was coerced into it, you know, and so she says she had no idea that he and the other and Eric had assembled an arsenal of explosives and guns. She uh, said, we believed his participation in the massacre was accidental or that he had been coerced. We believed that he did not intend to hurt anyone. Which is what any good person you know. Wouldn't you think that about your own kid? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I mean I it's you would never think that your kid would be capable of doing something. So well, I'll have, to, right. I'll have to read it. It sounds very interesting to me, and I, I just. But it know. also kind of, it also kind of but, freaks me out, you know, like that to be where it had no inkling her son was depressed or suicidal. Uh, I don't know. Just kind of scary. As yeah, a that's that, that's the other thing you carry around, right? That you never know what one thing you're going to say to your kids that starts this sort of. The shadow side, and one day you end up uh, right. simulating an arsenal. Uh, an arsenal? What am I even talking about? An arsenal. <laughs> uh, I mean, well, it also speaks to you know how how much do you how much do you snoop's not the right word, but well maybe it is <laughs> yeah. as a parent. You know that's a good question. You know? uh, we have actually talked about that with our kids. Have you guys? The snooping part? No, yeah. I think mine are too young. Don't you? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah, what, uh, what we've told our kids is that uh, they live in our house and everything's fair game and, and they, they have no privacy. However, we will not snoop unless we think we need to for something. So their job is to not give us any excuse to snoop. But if they do give us an excuse to snoop, we will and we have every right to and they have no right to complain about it. Yeah, I mean, I good approach, I guess. Yeah, yeah I, I kind of look that way. The thing that that scares me more, the, you know, I've got a my youngest is a three year old, and I, I mean, here's a kid who walks up to a computer, and you know, he'll walk up to you know my wife's laptop sitting on the kitchen table during dinner, and he'll go into iTunes and start some music. You know, I mean, he's that it it's the computer snooping that I think yeah. uh, I think is more is, it, 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 scary. That's more yeah. terrifying than than anything else. Yeah. Are you going to, you mean snooping, you mean it's, you're going to snoop to see where your kids are going on that computer? Yeah, I mean, email, uh, yeah. you know, web, uh, communities, social networks, that sort of stuff, I think is, it's worth keeping, uh, keeping up to date on that stuff. Yeah, I agree. And we do, yeah. we do typical things, computers in a public area, um, passwords, everybody knows, right. access to accounts, uh, all that kind of stuff, because Part of it's not that you don't trust your kids. It's that they're young and, and they can be influenced pretty easily. And right. so they don't know right. who's influencing them. Right. Because that's, it, it's not Yeah, best. exactly. It's, and, and my kids ask about that. Well, don't you trust me? And it says, you know, honey, it's not that I don't trust you. It's just that you are not yet a growing up. And so you tend to be a little more impressionable. And somebody can come along and say, hey, let's go do this. And you haven't fully thought it through. And I don't want you to do that. So my job is to protect you and keep you safe. And, um, you know, we have right. teenage, we have 13 year old kid and our oldest is 13. So we're prime in the middle of that. Ugh. And it's, oh, it's, yeah. it's not easy. It's not, you know, it's not fun, but well, yeah, it, just, it turns my stomach just that, you know, that's coming. How do you deal with that? Stomach? I know. I know. Oh. Let me, let me tell you what else uh, turns my stomach. Yeah. How do you, how do you guys feel about Krispy Kreme? Just donuts in general. Love them. Do you? Do you eat yeah. them? Do you, do you double fist them? <laughs> I don't eat them very often because I'm not sure that they're particularly good for me. But, oh, yeah, they're good. Well, let me let me ask you yeah, a, a they... corollary. Uh, how do you feel about uh, bacon cheeseburgers? Uh, my favorite standby, absolutely. 
All right. So now we've got uh, we've got two yays on the. We love the Krispy Kreme. We love the. How would you feel so about a Krispy Kreme donut burger? Yeah. No. Oh God. That's a big no. hit. Apparently, oh. it's a fifteen hundred calorie uh, oh. a hamburger with uh, with Krispy Kreme donuts as buns. Oh, oh my no. Yeah. That's you're, disgusting. You're making that up. No, I'm looking at it right now. Uh, a new twist to oh. eating your dessert first. The Krispy Kreme donut burger is a big hit at fairs this year. The bacon cheeseburger that uses two Krispy Kreme donuts for buns has 1,500 cal- calories, basically a day's worth of calories in a meal. Uh. <laughs> uh, junk food creation is said to have originated in Decatur, Georgia, of course. <laughs> Uh-huh. According to the story, one bar owner ran no out of... No offense to Georgia. This is the best part. According to what sto- the story, a bar owner ran out of buns one day and used two glazed Krispy Kreme donuts instead. This created what he called the Luther Burger after singer Luther Vandross. Because, of course. Uh, since then, the uh, creation's been featured by the Southern Cooking Queen, Paula Dean. You can see her creating the Krispy Kreme Burger and trying it online. She calls it stinking wonderful at this year's massachusetts big e fair they've sold 1000 of the Krispy kreme burgers each day the fair lasts 17 days oh at the big e fair they call them the craze e capital on the e burgers you're gonna put that up on our site i will it's uh Uh, it's not good yeah yeah (laughs) doesn't even sound amazing no mary's vegetarian so clearly it's not appetizing but even though it, it's just What's, a, they actually grill the Krispy Kremes, you see the grill lines on the Krispy Kremes themselves. I mean, it's really a, they, it's a well thought out burger. If you're if you're going to be doing that, uh, <laughs> well, you get your savory and your sweet in one bite. I know it's almost like uh, it, it's 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 moving through the meal too fast. You know, I mean, I I want to savor it. <laughs> uh, people are weird. Dude. Uh, well, and you know, it's this kind of innovation. We... It's this kind of innovation that may just save Krispy Kreme, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, Krispy Kreme has certainly struggled growing too fast, and the healthcare kick, they're certainly not, uh, you know, on the right side of the tracks in that respect. But I don't know. I, I do have an adult every once in a while, man, just stopping by and picking up Krispy Kreme. Oh. Oh, yeah. yeah that's, they're melting your mouth. They, that's they the do. Challenge. They, do, they literally melt in your mouth. How do they, they do. do that? I don't know. When they take them, when they give them to you right off the glazer. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just, all I hear is a sweet sucking sound. (laughs) Well, your artery shrinking. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Hey, by the way. They need to come up with a low carb one. (laughs) No No trans fats. Hey, so speaking of gross things, if you guys are interested, you can buy Michael Jackson's burnt hair from the Pepsi commercial. Did you know that? Oh, that's horrendously awful. Oh, it is, yeah, I think it's on eBay or something. I'm, I'm looking at the... At How the, much is it going for? Well, let's see. Jackson's burnt hair up for sale uh, says that it's doubled in price over the last couple of years. Well, since he died. Uh, just trying to find some details here. Uh, looks like it's going to selling the item. Oh, in, uh, in London on October 17th. So if you want to make a bid, you better hurry up. I'll, I'll post this on our site. So you guys get all the info if you want to make a bid. So, well, uh, yeah, I mean, count, count me in, right? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I want to, and how, do, how are you guaranteed it's his burnt hair? Well, I they talked burn about my own hair and yeah, they sell. talked about that, that when, when he, you know, his hair caught on fire during the Pepsi commercial that somebody ran up to him and grabbed him with his jacket and covered him and, and that the hairs were extracted from the jacket and certified at the time or something. Uh, so, oh. yeah, so you can get you, too, can be a part of the Michael Jackson legacy. Oh, that's just horrendous. Get the DNA record with it. Yeah, I would suspect so. I don't I don't know. Yeah. So I'll <laughs> post it up there. So <laughs> anyone who's interested, burn hair for sale. That's awful. All yours. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, yes. Well, people, I think we are uh, uh, with that. I think we're officially out of things to talk that? about. Can you top that? I can't. Yeah, we've been I all over nothing. the map today. Yeah, I yeah, know. Seriously, uh, but uh, thank you guys for uh, 
uh, you know, working through the uh, Skype uh, quarantine alternative to our live beer show. Uh, Thanks. It, it's been good. It's we'll worked, be back right? together guys, next week. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure something out for next oh. week. Yep. Uh, if Jamie's out of lockdown. And uh, uh, thank you all for listening. On behalf of uh, Jamie and Mary, uh, I'm Pete Wright. And this has been another fun-filled episode of Beer 30 Live. We're out. <laughs> <laughs>